Well, back here in the U.S., there are bold new guidelines in the works to scrutinize blockbuster business deals and ensure they're in the interests of consumers and competition. Assistant Attorney General Jonathan Cantor and Chair of the Federal Trade Commission Lena Kahn joined Walter Isaacson to discuss. Jonathan Cantor and Lena Kahn, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Great to be here. Uh, let me start with you, Mr. Cantor, which is for more than a century, antitrust law has been built on two pillars ever since the Sherman Antitrust Act, the Clayton Act, and U.S. v. Standard Oil. It's been harm to consumers. And another standard in the balance has been harm to competition in general. I want to explain the new guidelines you've issued. And it seems to me that pretty much along the lines of older guidelines, except for they add one component, which is harm to workers. Is that about right? So uh, the guidelines are not law. They're simply a reflection of the current modern case law. And modern case law applies to workers. But the guidelines are not just about harm to workers. It's a central feature. But it's also about recognizing modern realities. For example, uh, the guidelines talk about technology platforms. The guidelines talk about roll-ups of serial acquisitions. The guidelines talk about entrenchment of monopoly power, recognizing that sometimes a firm that has a really dominant position can acquire a competitive threat. All of those are ways in which competition presents itself. So when we started writing these guidelines, we had an important question. Important question is, how does competition in this market present itself? And does this merger threaten that competition? And that question is going to be different for every industry. It's going to be different for every merger. But we have to start with the facts. We have to start with a deep, sophisticated understanding of how competition works. And it works differently today than it did 50 years ago. Phones don't have rotors. Documents are not stored in file cabinets. Uh, and with the um, exception of my dad at the time, people don't stop and ask the gas station for directions. Um, Things have changed, um, and that's great, but we need to make sure we understand those changes with a deep level of sophistication, and we're addressing competition as it is, not as it was. Chair Khan, you've talked about decades of retreat, and I think what you mean is retreat from that standard, not of harm to consumers, but of harm to competition in general. Tell me about that decade of retreat. So look, we look very closely at the empirical evidence and how markets have evolved over recent decades. We always wanna make sure that we're enforcing the law in a way that's fully reflecting the reality of how businesses and today's economy are competing and are growing. There has been empirical evidence and research showing that uh, unfortunately, markets have become consolidated in recent decades. And so we at this moment have an even more important job to do to be vigorously enforcing the antitrust laws, protecting fair competition, preserving open markets, uh, because Congress told us that we have a preference for competition over consolidation. Competition benefits consumers through uh, providing better quality products, lower prices, it can benefit workers by providing them more options and opportunities and better wages. And then open markets is how we have remained at the forefront globally, where breakthrough innovations and incredible technological feats have been produced in America in good part because of our free enterprise system of open competitive markets. And that's what we're charged with preserving. Let me ask you about your phrase that competition always helps consumers. Uh, the shirt I'm wearing, for example, I got it. It's Amazon Essential. So are my trousers. I used to get those shirts from Land's End. I used to get them from Dockers. But as I got them through Amazon, they noticed my buying habits and gave me cheaper, easier ways to do it. It seems to me that's good for the consumer, even though it's really bad for Land's End and Dockers. Do we focus on things like a platform like Amazon using its information to be anti-competitive, or do we just look at, hey, I kind of feel guilty about wearing these things, but it's good for me as a consumer? So as a general matter, we look very closely at the facts and specifically whether businesses are engaging in any anti-competitive practices to maintain their monopolies in illegal ways. Um, it's under the antitrust laws, not illegal to be big. It's not illegal to be dominant. What's illegal is becoming a monopoly or becoming dominant in ways 
that are involving illegal business practices. That can be illegal mergers. It can be illegal conduct. And so we're very focused on whether there has any been any illegality in terms of how firms are using their market power to block out competition and make it difficult for consumers and workers to have more options. Mr. Cantor, uh, following up on that, one of your great predecessors as the antitrust division at the uh, Justice Department was Joel Klein. And he and the lawyer David Boyce brought this landmark case against Microsoft, which is just what Chair Khan has been talking about. They use their dominance in the desktop operating system of PCs to get into the browser business, maybe even get into the search business. Tell me how that case, which I think is the last really big case to be decided by a lot of courts, how that affects what you can do in the Justice Department. Absolutely. That was an historic case brought by our predecessors here at the Antitrust Division. And it established the important principle that a platform can be a market. And in the case of Microsoft, it tells us a lot about today's technologies. So the, that case dealt with merging threats. They called them nascent threats at the time. The idea that something could come along and disrupt the operating system and lead to a new generation of technologies that could provide benefits that we couldn't even imagine at the time. And so the Justice Department brought a case to protect those new innovations and give them the opportunity to reach consumers, to reach entrepreneurs, to reach businesses. And so Microsoft establishes the principle that if you have a dominant platform and you harm competition by squashing emerging competitive threats, emerging innovations and emerging technologies, that can be illegal under the antitrust laws, the same antitrust laws that were used to address Standard Oil and AT&T. So let me ask you, Chair Khan, if you look at things like what happened to Microsoft, that allowed Google to come along and do a Chrome browser and a search engine, but now Google is bundling all these things. How do you apply at the FTC these precedents that were set by the Justice Department cases? So we look very closely at all of the relevant legal precedents. Uh, there have been a whole set of seminal antitrust cases over the last few decades, and we've gotten from the courts really important legal decisions that have been applying what are you know century-old antitrust laws in new contexts. And that's the beauty of our antitrust laws, is that they establish legal principles about appropriate ways to be competing. And it's up to us as enforcers to be applying those principles in all sorts of contexts. So for example, last year, the Federal Trade Commission sued two pesticide manufacturers uh, because they were engaging in these pay to block schemes that were blocking generic producers from the market. And as a result of that, Farmers had to pay billions of dollars more than they would have, and we as the food paying public also ended up paying for those practices. So we can see how when you have dominant firms that are engaging in, in practices that are designed to block out competition, that can have very negative effects. And you can see that uh, in digital markets, you can see that in agriculture markets, uh, it's really economy wide that we as antitrust enforcers are charged by Congress to be vigilant and be protecting and preserving open competitive markets. Uh, Chair Khan, uh, as you know, probably full well, you've come a bit of a lightning rod as a symbol of much more aggressive, or at least more aggressive, antitrust enforcement. And it's become a sense that you're anti-business because of this. Even Larry Summers, who was President Obama's Treasury Secretary, you know, said that you've created a war on business. Those are his words. And certainly, especially Republicans, but some Democrats even, are trying to cut back a bit on FTC funding and guidelines. Uh, how do you respond to the fact that it really does seem like you're hurting business in a way? So look, antitrust is good for uh, what antitrust is really about is preserving open competitive markets. And when you have open competitive markets, that guarantees that the best ideas win. What we want is an economy and a market that Congress prescribed where if you have a good idea, you're able to bring it to market, you're able to compete on the merits. And so if consumers like your product, you're actually able to succeed in the marketplace. Uh, we at the FTC hear routinely from businesses, including independent pharmacists, independent grocers, 
uh, people across sectors who come to us and tell us that for them as businesses, it becomes very difficult to compete if they're getting muscled out of the market by monopolists who might be engaging in anti-competitive practices. And so we make a, a very concerted effort to be hearing from businesses because we understand that robust antitrust enforcement is really the way that we're going to see the type of competition and the type of innovation that for decades has kept America at the forefront and delivered significant innovation, preserving competitive markets as Congress has prescribed is the way to keep doing that. Do you think these new guidelines are going to go to the Supreme Court at some point? And what do you think the uh, outcomes could be? That's the beauty of our legal system is cases move through the courts. But um, the last time I checked, Supreme Court cases don't expire. Um, and so uh, cases that were decided right around the time the antitrust laws were amended, um, cases like Brown Shoe uh, and cases like Philadelphia National Bank that established these core principles were designed to interpret the statute. And guess what? Cases today cite all of those old Supreme Court cases. So until the Supreme Court reverses itself, and unless they do, we have an obligation to follow the law as it's written and as it's interpreted by courts. And that's exactly what courts are doing. And so we're going back to first principles. We're going back to basics. This is an exercise in law enforcement. These are statutes written by Congress. And for good reason, because competition and democracy, competition and freedom, competition and economic liberty all go hand in hand. And we're gonna enforce the law as written, as interpreted by courts, when supported by the facts, in order to vindicate those interests for the public. Chair Khan, one of the arguments used by, especially the technology companies that wanna to get together, is that we're competing with China. And that without big companies and the efficiencies that come from that, we're going to be crushed by China in terms of everything from AI to other technology issues. Does that enter into your calculus? It's such a good question, Walter, because you're absolutely right that these are arguments that sometimes get made. And this is an area where our history can be extremely instructive. So these are very similar arguments that were being made during the Cold War, where there was pressure on antitrust enforcers to hold back and protect domestic monopolies. And at that moment, America wisely made the choice to trust our system of free enterprise and competitive markets and trust that that type of open competitive system would out innovate a centralized system of state backed monopolies. And that's exactly what we saw. Um, in the decades since, we've seen enormous innovation. We've seen American companies uh, really at the forefront globally. And so I take a lot of um, guidance from that history where when we've trusted in our open competitive markets, that's really been what's best positioned us to compete globally, given just the ingenuity and innovation that American businesses have been able to provide. Let me ask both of you, starting with Mr. Cantor, to look at the next great big emerging uh, industry and idea, which is artificial intelligence. We're competing with China in it. We have hundreds of firms trying to enter the market. And yet we also have the two big dominant firms, Google and Microsoft. Google was allowed to buy DeepMind, which is at the forefront of artificial intelligence. And Microsoft has made a relationship, an investment relationship, and to some extent partnership with OpenAI. Starting with you, Mr. Cantor, tell me how you all are looking at artificial intelligence and whether that's even an economic market that's subject to antitrust. Yeah. So. Inflection points in technology are often the most important moment to protect in terms of competition because that's when it become, markets become contestable. But in order to do that, we have to make sure that we understand AI at a level of sophistication. And so just as in the 80s, the antitrust agencies rightly equipped themselves with some of the most talented economists so that we can understand markets better, and we continue to do that, to do that till this day, we need to make sure that we're also bringing in the technological expertise to understand these technologies with greater sophistication. And we're doing that by hiring data scientists, AI experts. But let me also say, one of the big important changes with AI is that data is no longer a byproduct 
of the technology. It is the product of the technology. And so we are in a world where artificial intelligence lives and breathes on massive amounts of data. And so to the extent that markets are not contestable and competitive across the economy, including in healthcare, including in energy and agriculture, the AI technologies that are going to be built are going to tip only to the firms that have the greatest amount of data and information. So it's extremely important that in order to usher in a competitive and vibrant revolution of new technologies for AI, that our markets are competitive and access to data and information is something that is accessible broadly and that we don't just allow the small number of players with the most data to tip and win those markets uncontested. Uh, Chair Khan, let me ask you to comment on that notion of data and whether or not data uh, can be leveraged to create dominance in a field or whether it should be more open in the future. So it's certainly true that in digital markets in particular, we've seen data become a critical input uh, where you have to have access to data in order to be able to scale and in order to be able to compete. And so just with any other input or critical resource, uh, it's really important that we are preserving open competitive access to this data, which can be so critical to compete. You know, Walter, we want to make sure that Everybody is clear that the antitrust laws entirely apply, even in contexts involving AI. I think sometimes we hear arguments that some of these technologies are emerging in some type of regulatory vacuum. And we think it's extraordinarily important that the market knows that existing laws prohibiting collusion still apply, existing laws prohibiting discrimination apply, existing laws prohibiting fraud apply. And so there's no AI exemption from the existing laws on the books. And we think it's especially important given how revolutionary these technologies could be that we're preserving the contestability of markets uh, and avoiding uh, any illegal behavior. Lena Khan, Jonathan Cantor, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having me.